Okay. So, Fred was, he'd gone to Washington, D.C. He had a business thing. He had, his business went really well. Everything was perfect. He was sober. He was having a good time. Everything was perfect. And when he went to dinner, he said, maybe a couple of cocktails at dinner wouldn't hurt me. And that started off a whole binge that was horrific. Drank then. He, he went for a walk, came back, walked drank some more at the hotel and then drank all night long and drank until the early morning. And then he had to fly back from there to home and he was supposed to meet his wife at the airport, but ended up being so drunk that he met a cab driver who drove him around for days on end and he just drank the whole time and really had a mess and ended up putting him in a hospital. So, he had already talked to Bill and Bob because he'd been in the hospital before. He was a guy that got so drunk and messed up that he went to the hospital. And when they said, well, why are you here? And he says, I'm here to rest my nerves. When in fact, he was there because of alcoholic poisoning, but we don't ever want to admit it. So he says, I'm just resting my nerves. So Bill and, and Bob asked him to tell the story. So after he had done all that stuff, on the bottom of page 41, that last paragraph on that page is the last paragraph we read last week. It says, as soon as I regained my ability to think, I went carefully over that evening in Washington. Not only had I been off guard, I had made no fight whatever against the first drink. This time I had not thought of the consequences at all. I had commenced to drink as carelessly as though the cocktails were ginger ale. I now remembered what my alcoholic friends had told me, how they prophesied that if I had an alcoholic mind, the time and place would come, I would drink again. And they had said that though I did raise a defense, it would one day give way before some trivial reason for having a drink. Well, just that did happen and more. For what I had learned of alcoholism did not occur to me at all. I knew from that moment that I had an alcoholic mind. So that's the first time he admitted that he was an alcoholic. He said, I saw that willpower and self-knowledge would not help in those strange mental blank spots. I had never been able to understand people who said that a problem had been hopelessly defeated. I knew then it was a crushing blow. So that's, this guy finally admits that he's an alcoholic. He knows he has an alcoholic mind. And now the strange behaviors he had noticed in other people, he's noticing in himself. And he realized that Self-knowledge, which he thought he was smart enough to not drink. That wasn't true because he drank. You know, he thought self-knowledge and willpower would keep him sober. But it didn't. It failed miserably. So then he's trying to recover from this horrible drinking bout. And so it says on page 42, first paragraph, two of the members of Alcoholics Anonymous came to see me. They grinned, which I didn't like so much, and then asked if I thought myself alcoholic and if I were really licked this time. I had to concede both propositions. So he admitted he was an alcoholic and he admitted complete defeat. That's step one. At that moment, he took step one. He had been playing with it for a little while, but now he took step one. They piled on me heaps of evidence to the effect that an alcoholic mentality, such as I had exhibited in Washington, was a hopeless condition. They cited cases out of their own experience by the dozen. This process snuffed out the last flicker of conviction that I could do the job myself. So he's asking for help for the first time. And this guy had been in and out of the hospital several times. He talked to Bill and Bob several times, but he would never admit he was an alcoholic, would never admit that he was defeated. 
said he could do it by self-knowledge and willpower, and yet he's in the hospital again after this horrible de debacle in Washington, D.C., and the days that followed. And finally, he had to admit it. So he admitted that he was powerless over alcohol and that he was he had hit bottom. Now, this is a high-bottom drunk. This is a rich guy. This is a big businessman flying back and forth all over the place. He never lost his home. He never lost his wife. He never lost his family. He never lost his job. He hadn't lost anything. He had just started to get sick from drinking and ended up in the hospital, a, a wreck. So it was starting to bother him physically, but he hadn't lost anything. It wasn't like he wasn't a skid row bum. He wasn't sleeping behind a dumpster. He hadn't lost anything, but alcohol had finally defeated him. So we don't have to go, just keep going down to the bottom. We can pick our own bottom. We can quit digging the hole anytime we want to by just putting down the shovel. So no matter where you are in this thing, you can just quit anytime. So what came next? He admitted he was powerless. And he, it says in that one line, he says, I, can, I had to concede both of those propositions. And if we remember back on page 30 of the same chapter, it says on the second paragraph, we learned we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. That's the definition of step one of what we have to do. We have to admit it to our innermost selves. And this guy finally did that. So what happens next? He's go, he goes, then they outline the spiritual answer and the program of action, which a hundred of them had followed successfully. The spiritual answer is step two, coming to believe the power greater than yourself, and step three, turning your will and your life over to care of God, and then the program of action is all the rest of our steps, four through 12. That's the program of action that the first 100 of us followed in detail, followed all the way through. He says, though I had been only a nominal churchman, their proposals were not intellectually hard to swallow, but the program of action though entirely sensible, was pretty drastic. Why was it drastic? Because it meant change. And he goes, it meant that I would have to throw several lifelong conceptions out of the window. That was not easy. But the moment I made up my mind to go through with the process, turn your will over to the care of God, I had curious feelings that my alcoholic condition was relieved as in fact it proved to be so such a minimal start of him finally admitting he was an alcoholic and then accepting on an intellectual level that there was a power greater than himself that could restore him to sanity and being willing to look into that power and being willing to turn his will and his life over to that power started him on the process, and that's all he needed to start. And then looking at the rest of the program and finding out what the program called for. But it was sensible to him. And even though he really wasn't a very religious guy, being told that a power greater than himself was needed to get sober, he was able to accept that, at least on that minimal level. He didn't have to do a giant thing. He just had to accept it on a minimal level. We don't need to do much to get on the right path. He goes on to say, quite as important was the discovery that spiritual principles would solve all my problems. I have since been brought into a way of living infinitely more satisfying and, I hope, more useful than the life I'd lived before. My old manner of life was by no means a bad one, but I would not exchange its best moments for the worst I have now. I would not go back even if I could. 
So a satisfied customer, he got sober. He started to realize that by working this program of action, doing the steps, coming to believe in a power greater than himself and turning his will and his life over to that power, that he could, in fact, live a much better life than he had lived before. And that wasn't a bad life. But the life he got from the program of action was better than that. So he he was glad that he had, had finally gotten there. Fred's story speaks for itself. We hope it strikes home to thousands like him. He had felt only the little nip of the ringer. Again, he's a high bottom drunk. Most alcoholics have, have to be pretty badly mangled before they really commence to solve their problems. Many doctors and psychiatrists agree with our conclusions. One of these men, a staff member of the world-renowned hospital, recently made this statement to some of us. What you say about the general hopelessness of the average alcoholic's plight is, in my opinion, correct. As to two of you men whose stories I have heard, there is no doubt in my mind that you were 100% hopeless apart from divine help. Had you offered yourselves as patients at this hospital, I would not have taken you if I had been able to avoid it. People like you are too heartbreaking. Though not a religious person, I have profound respect for the spiritual approach in such cases as yours. For most cases, there is virtually no other solution. Once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink, except in a few rare cases, neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. His defense must come from a higher power. So we finished now more about alcoholism. Before that, we read there is a solution, and uh, there is a solution went through uh, kind of it, it talked a little bit about alcoholism and our problems with alcohol, and then the rest of it talked about a solution and that solution being a higher power. So it it led into both of these chapters, more about alcoholism and the chapter we're reading next, which is the agnostics, which talks primarily about step two. And we have Bill's story before that. And Bill's story was a great story of someone who started off not as an alcoholic, just as a person who drank occasionally, but progressed on to becoming a full-fledged alcoholic, no doubt about it suffered horribly for a long time and then with the help of a friend who had found a solution was able to recover from that helpless and hopeless state of mind and became sober stayed sober and started aa that was bill wilson and bill wilson got bob smith sober so it was bill and bob and then they got Bill Dodson sober because they carried the message to the next alcoholic. And they helped this guy, Fred, because they went to him and talked to him and got him sober. And they told stories and they identified with him and related their experiences in not only getting drunk, but also in getting sober. And that was the final step, the 12th step, to turn around and carry the message back to people who have never heard the message before so that's the whole program of action that they're talking about here and fred took it up and he started doing what he needed to do and he got sober and stayed sober bill stayed sober Do bill dodson stayed sober dr bob smith stayed sober because they worked this program followed the program of action listened to the instructions and made certain decisions now in step one, which we're, we're talking about in this chapter in particular, we have to admit that we're alcoholic. We admitted we were, we, were, we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. 
okay? And that's on degrees. In, in other words, your life doesn't, you don't have to be in a ditch to finally say your life is unmanageable. You know, if you can't control your drinking, if, if when you want to quit, you can't quit altogether. And when you drink, if you can't control how much you drink, even if it's a month apart, if you can't stop when you want to, and if you, when you drink, you drink more than, you know, you're, you have no control over how much you drink, then you're an alcoholic. And we, you know, people have to be told that because people don't understand what alcoholism is. The doctors back at that point didn't really understand what they knew what alcoholism was, but they had no idea what a cure was. Some of the doctors knew what alcoholism was and kind of knew what there, there might be a solution, but they couldn't go there because it was outside the realm of a doctor. Doctor couldn't actually do that. And so it all came together through a group of people that worked tight with each other and found out stuff and shared what they learned until they got it together where it was a program of action that helped a hundred people get sober and stay sober. So step one is what more about alcoholism is about. Now, after this chapter, when we get into the agnostics, we're talking about a higher power and how to get that higher power in your life and how to relate to that higher, higher power. There's not a lot of talking about alcoholism. There's not a lot of talk about alcohol. We told that, you know, if you don't accept some of these things as, as you're taught, if you don't accept them, you're probably going to drink again. That's what they had told Fred. Fred wouldn't admit he was an alcoholic. And they said, well, if you admit you're an alcoholic and, and, and take our suggestions, you won't have to get drunk again. But if you don't accept it, then you probably will. Well, sure enough, he didn't accept it and he got drunk again. And then he finally, you know, decided to, to get sober and stay sober. And how it works, we're going to talk about step three a lot and step four and how to get started into the program of action and what all that means. And uh, we're going to learn a lot. And if we follow those instructions and directions, suggestions, however you want to say it, then you have half a chance of getting sober, staying sober, and helping other alcoholics achieve sobriety, which is our ultimate goal. And if we do step two right, after we read through we agnostics, then we'll begin to have a spiritual experience. And it's that spiritual experience in step two and in step three when it starts and we start getting that spiritual experience and get that relationship with a higher power that we begin to be able to, with the help of that higher power, not take a drink, have a defense against a drink. Without that higher power, a defense against the first drink is nearly impossible. You can do it for a while, but you won't do it for long. So you need a higher power to help you, and you need to accept that higher power. You need to turn your will and your life over to the uh, care of God. And um, it's not very hard to do. I came in, I am far from a person that you would call religious. And the God thing had been an issue in my life before until I came into AA. And when I came into AA, I found evidence of a power greater than myself. It was told to me by the people in these rooms. They showed me the evidence of it. They showed me how to find the evidence, to seek the evidence that there's a power. And in the beginning, it was a little tiny thing. It was just a little idea in my head, like a seed. But as that seed got nurtured by the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, that seed sprouted and grew, and I began to have a real experience. And that experience still grows today. So we're, we're in for a treat when we get into we agnostics. So we're going to stop there. We're going to start with we agnostics fresh next week. 
And if you'd like, we could talk a little bit. We have a little bit of time to talk about what happened to you that you found the fact that you are an alcoholic? How did you, how did it come to be in your life that you said, you know something, I'm an alcoholic, I'm defeated. I'm, you know, my life, I'm, I'm powerless over alcohol and my life is unmanageable. How did that come about in your life that you got here, you're sitting here today? <laughs> 